achamos que é fundamental que todos nasçam livres. We believe it's mandatory that everybody is free. Every child, every person, freedom makes us think about independence, autonomy, the way of acting according to our will. But what is the will? What do we really want? Do our desires or consumption dreams, are they in line with the future that we want? When was it that prosperity of our species started to put at risk the survival of others? And even ours. And what prosperity is this? In, uh, in which many people are excluded, living at extremely vulnerability, we miss a lot whenever there is a flood in our city, a fire destroying our forest. This utilitary way of looking at nature threatens the whole biodiversity and our survival itself. We are a species that is not in harmony with the others. Why? because we are still stuck to the lifestyle that puts at risk our home, our life. That's why we need to think better about what it means to have freedom. Let's be free to change our lives and uh, build our pathways. The challenges are many, I know, but the good news is that we have a lot of people showing where to go, people trying to promote a good and big change to our society. We are talking about researchers, gov governance, young leaderships, traditional people, and also companies, associations, collective groups. Because to build this new pathway, we need to account to count on everyone. We need partnerships, pay attention to science, hear the traditional knowledge, hear the voices of each and everyone. My voice, yours too. This is how we'll discuss and find the way out to our challenges. We need more and more dialogue, diversity, and cooperation. So come, let's work together, join our knowledges and creativity to be in a more prosperous future to everyone. Saving nature is saving ourselves. We need it to prosper. Here is where we find experienced and new people from everywhere with different knowledges, everybody trying to answer the same question. What way to follow for the future we really want? You are free to plant the seeds of the future and to do so today. So come. What is the future we want to build? What way to follow? Seeds for the future. Nesse encontro é um prazer encontrá-los aqui para um abrir um seminário Sementes para o Futuro. So it's a pleasure to open the seminar Seeds for the Future today in partnership with IBG managing the Museum of Tomorrow and International Cooperation and today at the Day of the, La the Earth. This is a day to reflect and know our behavior and the values of our lives and the standards of consumption and quality that we want aiming at balance and harmony with nature, our biggest goal. At international conservation, we believe we can change the future by strengthening forests and bioeconomy and protecting the areas and improving the governance of traditional people and fomenting 
few days of conversation to Nancy Kara Ofukuru, uh, not only for Brazil, but also for the entire world. I look forward to the results and the creativity this meeting is going to provide for a better future. The Amazon, the living planet, needs you, your intelligence, your commitment, and your energy. We are here today to hear dreams having opinions, concrete opinions about their role to build that. And the focus of our conversation today is the value that each culture attributes to nature, the relation of people with nature. This is our starting point. The role of uh, our role to preserve nature is due to our knowledge, it's due to our tradition. This is what feeds us. That's how we are fed with the strength that we give us. And I think that even in different places and differentiated cultures, the origins are the same, both of the Black people or, as Amanda mentioned, a Black woman. And this is wonderful because the Black culture is in my culture as an extractivist. And I would say that oil drive, the, the weight and the pandemic and the impact was the same to the big cities and to the small cities. We need to look at the political solutions because individually I care about myself, one people, but in a collective solution, I impact my surrounding, I impact my community. With the politics, we can work and spread that. So we need the space because when we are in a debate, we can have public policies to give to our generation. We have the looks of those living and studying that. Well, my message that I would like to give to the leaders is that they don't forget that the leader doesn't lead only to themselves. They are ahead and representing people that trusted them to be there. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to open the day of this meeting. The meeting Seeds for the Future. You saw a wonderful speech of Gilberto Gil that inspires us a lot, talking on behalf of the planet, and also a summary of the first with the speeches of young women working for a better future. On this uh, Thursday, 29th, we'll talk about the solutions that are happening now. We will have a wonderful discussion mediated by the wonderful and inspiring journalist Daniela Chiaretti that blesses us with the important analysis on the environmental area and sustainability area. Germany will mediate a discussion between Lucian Filanova, manager of sustainability of Natura, and responsible for the Amazon program, and Carlos Carano, that is an ecologist that inspires us in the environmental area, and Francisco Fianco, that is a genius leader. So I won't pass the floor to the other uh, round table without saying that the discussion last week by President Biden, we had some hope of the future when many countries committed to more ambitious goals in terms of fighting uh, the climate changes and some countries and companies announced resources in a fund called MIF to protect the uh, forests. The words of many leaderships in the whole world inspires us to work hard this year till the end of the year, when we'll have the climate COP in Glasgow, Scotland, where we'll have once again 
an opportunity for the countries to improve their missions in the climate change challenge. And Brazil will have this opportunity. We hope Brazil honors what the citizens expect because we can be this country of the big economy of the future, bringing food to many of the inhabitants of this planet. And Brazil, that is the biggest guardian of the Amazon forest, and among them are the indigenous people. So protecting the indigenous people, working for a more sustainable economy and supporting uh, areas is mandatory. We have this commitment of avoiding the cycling point and the point of no return. We want that to be avoided to the most. Therefore, this discussion here is to find the future and to see that we have uh, the conditions to avoid this point of no return in which the forest will stop being a forest. So this is a of you to engage in all that. We will now have a very rich debate mediated by Daniela. I am Raquel from International Conservation, and I pass now the floor to Sergio Besserman, who will have his opening words. So greetings to everyone and have a nice work. Thank you, Raquel. I am Sergio Besserman. It's a pleasure to be here. I have uh, two representativities here. I'm talking on sustainability by Museu de Manhã, but I'm also from Conservation International. I'm on the board of conservation, International Conservation, and I'm especially happy due to the reasons that Raquel just mentioned. As last week, we had this wonderful discussion coordinated by the wonderful journalist, Daniela Chiaretti. And with this message that Raquel uh, said about the, the property, and I'll avoid repeating that, but I shared the ideas the same way. And I can say that to humanity, it doesn't matter the challenge of the global uh, climate crisis that we are dealing in, by uh, diversity and so on. It doesn't matter if we don't know the, choo uh, the, the choices that we have. And we need the means, the technology, the needed knowledge and science and the traditional peoples and populations that are in contact with nature to bring the solution. Therefore, this idea of present solutions for the future. It's, it doesn't matter having only technology and what we have in the Brazilian society and also to the human civilization is a challenge of choices, choices to be made, uh, being aware and free and equal uh, to do that, may uh, you be a woman or a man, regardless of your social or political or economic condition, because this is what is important in this wonderful debate, because having the right knowledge and the right choices, we can change reality that uh, we are living. So the seeds are with us. We need to plant them. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Daniela Chiaretti. I'm an environmental reporter at Valor Econômico. I thank Raquel and Sergio for the kind words. And I'm very happy and honored to be here mediating this panel with three very interesting people that will talk uh, soon. Fabio Scarano. Francisco Pianco, that I'm quite happy to see here, and Luciana Villanova, that I can't see here, but I believe she's here. Okay, now she's here. 
Well, before anything else, I would like to thank uh, for the opportunity to be here and complain about Saturday because today we reached more than 400,000 deaths in Brazil. It's absolutely sad to all the families that uh, are missing their beloved ones. And this pandemic has everything to do with what we will discuss today and the way we relate to nature with this continue of breaking barriers and uh, thresholds. When I was invited to mediate this round table, people in the production of Museum of Tomorrow and International Conservation sent me wonderful material and I would like to read only three sentences saying that we are one of the most dangerous species in the planet and this is because the impacts of human activity are a great threat to the Earth biodiversity. After the Industrial Revolution, we changed the way we live. Our relation with nature was changed. We eat and we consume more. We take almost all the terrestrial environments, the population that is growing exponentially. We change the planet and we are degrading the environment a lot. I mean, not everyone, because the indigenous populations live differently and we are lucky for that. We have to learn from them. So without any further ado, first, I would like to do something that I should have done before, this audio description for people with a low sight that are here. So I am a white woman with a long hair, gray hair, a little bit confusing my hair, and I'm wearing a coat that I believe is red, but everybody says it's pink. And that's it. So now I will invite to the discussion the, uh, about the subject of the second event that is a little bit of this idea that we are living this history, historical moment in which the future of the planet and next generations is being decided and the changes that we have to make because it has to be collective. So it's a little bit of a debate, answering questions, trying to find the answers and how to find the way to do that, respecting the others without disrespecting my values. So the idea is that Fabio, Luciana and Francisco can talk initially for three to five minutes and then we start with the questions even if people watching us want to send questions and if we have time we can read them so i will invite fabius carano as Raquel mentioned he is the professor of the biology institute at the federal university author of many books and uh speaker on biodiversity. He won two Jabuti Awards in Literature of Natural Sciences. So, Fabio, I pass on the floor to you. Good afternoon, Daniela, my dear friends at this round table, Francisco Luciano. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I would like to greet my dear Raquel and Sergio, who were here before me. I haven't seen them for such a while due to the pandemic, and it was good to see them. I could chat a little bit before the event starts, and I would also like to congratulate International Conservation that is celebrating 30 years in Brazil, and just a few institutions can do that here. So I would also like to congratulate the Museum of Tomorrow that is soon celebrating six years. And these are two organizations that you can believe that this time is not that much, 30 years, six years, but it's incredible how much they already have done for Brazil in this dialogue regarding nature and sustainability. I'm sorry, Fabio, please, I have to interrupt you to, for you to uh, describe so I'm white, I have short hair, I'm almost bald, bald, let's say. I have some gray hair and I'm wearing glasses. So this is a conversation that is very important for us in terms of solutions that we may develop here in the present to contemplate the future, a better future. 
I believe that the opening speech of our uh, forever minister, Gilberto Gil, says a lot of what I want to say. I believe this is such inspiring words. And I would like to start giving some data because I think it gives a little bit of uh, an idea of what we are facing in terms of crisis, because our uh, planet is now facing the sixth wave of the species extinction, but this is the first one caused only by one species. The first five ones were waves due to natural uh, climate changes and not caused by the human being. It means that we now have one million species in, uh, being threatened. And we have some species that we don't even know if they are threatened. Science couldn't even have access to these species. And our indigenous people here with the representation of Francisco, they already know that, which shows this lack of dialogue uh, and this gap that we need to fill. So the sad part of that is that this species and this biological diversity that we have here is the guardian, let's say, of a set of gifts that nature gives us every day. The water we drink, uh, stable weather, our culture, a lot of that is a reflex of what we have in the nature, all the language diversity and people diversity, all that nature gives us and missing, uh, losing biodiversity, we lose that. So it comes against us. And the result of that, in my opinion, is that it generates, as Daniela mentioned very well on her initial, initial speech, is this separation of the modern human being from nature. This separation has a long history, but it gains action with the Industrial Revolution, but especially after the war, the human being, I mean, the a white modern human being, in the perspective of the European tradition, especially that spread in the continent, we separated from nature as we believe we can control it. So if we remember Plato in the ancient Greece, it's completely different. But we believe that we have this control against what he said. And we treat nature as a commodity. We use it wrongly. We destroy it. And it comes against the planet and against all of us. So in part, at a great extent, the way out is that we have to reintegrate with nature. We need to understand that we are part of nature. And many times we say, hey, how can we find this way, the solution? And this is how I believe that Gilberto Gil's speech is so important, because to find that out, we need to discuss the way out is not only in science, as we scientists believe. No, science needs to dialogue with all the other ways of knowledge and interpretation, because science is part of the problem. Science is a product of modernity, so it needs to open to dialogue so that we learn from other knowledges and uh, we all together, as Gilberto Gil mentioned, reach the solution. So I believe that part of what we do in terms of conserving what is left of nature that is not much is one point. And on the other hand, we need to restore, regenerate part of this nature where we can do that. So I believe that to help nature regenerate, we need to regenerate ourselves, we modern people. And what is this regeneration? Is building trust again on each other. And this trust involves love, respect, uh, love to the others, love, uh, self-love that we lo lost, and respect to nature as well, and the basic principles of love, love in yourself, the others, and nature, I see in many of the indigenous peoples, because they didn't separate from, from nature as we did. The traditional peoples didn't do that. So we need to learn from them. Francisco will teach us how to do that, how to be back on track. Francisco, how can we do that? 
So I believe that in this discussion about present solutions to the future, we have a huge problem on our hands. Biodiversity is a huge problem. Climate change is another one. We have this pandemic happening at great extent due to the damage we brought to nature. So it's a set of problems and science can diagnose them very well. But on the other hand, we have the solutions to the problem. And we always have a lot of people with a lot of solutions to present to us. I believe that from the problem to solution, there's something in between that is dialogue, as Gilberto Gil mentioned. So this dialogue is the big point in the present so that we can have a better future for everyone and for the planet. And with that, I pass on the floor to you, Daniela. And then I'll be available for to answer your question. Thank you, Fabio. You brought very important ideas. Now uh, we'll go back to them uh, soon. Thank you very much. It's very important that you talked about science, dialogue and regeneration. But now let's hear a little bit about Luciana Villanova's ideas. Good afternoon, Luciana. She is the manager of sustainability at Natura. She's been working for 15 years with new products of Natura and is in con constant contact with traditional communities. She has a lot of experience, a lot of stories to tell us about this dialogue, as Fabio mentioned. Luciana? Hello, Daniela. How are you? Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank on behalf of Natura for the invitation. Uh, to be here. Uh, CI is an important partner of us and Fabio Francisco to be here at this table with me today. And we are starting the year showing how important dial this dialogue is for this year. And I would like to bring a little bit of that. This is a very important moment for that to happen. And before anything else, I remember Daniela. Okay, thank you. So, I am a white woman with a dark brown hair. Uh, uh, they are on my shoulders. I'm wearing glasses and I'm wearing a blue jeans shirt. And I am on my son's bedroom because it's calmer here. So probably you can see a lot of toys in the background. And it's nice to be this nice environment, this family environment at this pandemic moment that is so difficult. So we couldn't imagine that as a planet, as a society, to be facing this situation. Anyway, I start from that to talk about it. As Fabio mentioned very well, this disconnection with nature, probably nature is calling us back. This pandemic is this call to tell us that we need to be back on track and we need to understand that we are part of nature. So I, I guess we are a little bit over that in terms of not respecting nature and so on. And we need to think about it. This pandemic is a reflex of that. If we look at the uh, human history, we've also uh, always had some crises, but recently, how many viruses as this one are there due to the way we behave, we relate, we extract from nature to produce our consumption? So I guess this is a warning and it's calling all of us in the community to look at ourselves and think how much we are forgetting who we are and that we are part of nature. We talk about nature as if we are not part of that, but we are part of it. So I think the first point to dialogue uh, for this dialogue is to think how to reconnect with this world. I mean, this world that is so industrialized and in such a way that we can dominate nature and extract from that what we want. So how can we go back and say that this knowledge that is important to humanity and that is also bringing a lot of impacts that are reverting against us, so how can we change all this knowledge, gather all this knowledge 
to everything that we are missing and losing and how traditional peoples and communities can help us. So how can we have this interdisciplinarity to connect traditional knowledge, the knowledge of those who are there in contact with nature and the knowledge of those who are thinking scientifically. And this is a very important year. This is mandatory because after so many treaties and conventions and a lot of academic discussions and governments and so on and on, we are reaching very important limits and we need to revert that. In 2015, in COP Paris, we defined the limits for global warming and we arrived in 2020 discussing this convention of the UN to define the limit and the regression of the biodiversity destruction. It should happen last year, but it was uh, postponed. And we we'll have the COP15 biodiversity. And again, we have to establish goals to reach, not empty goals, but clear goals to reach saying that we need to stop destroy, destroying nature, destroying biodiversity and start a new generation process and the invitation as a society for companies and institutions and traditional populations is to look at all that and say that there is no way to revert that without rethinking the economical model. Recently, John Welton, that is from the Triple Autumn Board, he had an attempt to rebuild that. And he said that everything is wrong. And in fact, the planet is uh, only one. And we are the ones that put the virus on Earth. And we need to understand that and live from the, uh, and understand the models and the way we relate with nature. And we need to work for that and work for people well-being and uh, every uh, living beings and this economical model talks not about the war and polarity between uh, capitalism and so on no this is an old discussion we know all that but we are talking about creating a new model that in fact is a regeneration what we need to create is uh, equity and value knowledge as uh, both a science knowledge and a traditional knowledge and that this dialogue brings solutions for us to have a better life, but not only for us, but all the living beings, we can't steal from nature anymore. So my invitation is to think about this economic model. I'm here to help you uh, brainstorm about it. I'm bringing the model of Natura company that started 20 years ago uh, to live from nature. And all the time we were making mistakes and correcting, making mistakes and correcting and learning how to take from a series of innovation initiatives and creation of products, how to do all that from the nature, but at the same time, think I'm thinking about how to preserve forests and biodiversity and promote including. We are still on our way. We don't have the answer, but I would like to uh, bring the challenge to you for discussion because now we think about sustainable economy and we need to think about the biodiversity that we have in Brazil that is a simple one. And we need to make a good use of that. So thank you and let's see how our dialogue goes. Thank you, Luciana. Thank you very much. Now I'm very happy to invite Francisco, that is um, a shiny leader, coordinator of the organization of indigenous people of Juruá River. And since his uh, young years, he's been helping people in Acre uh, to help their land. So. Bianco has mediated discussions with the FUNAI and he's had important role in creating the cooperative and he was a state secretary of indigenous people in Acre and he has important messages to send us. So thank you for being here. So you have the floor. 
I would like to thank, uh, in the name of, uh, on behalf of CAI and Museu do Amanhã for this space here. And Daniela, also Luciana, Fabio, um, my friends uh, that are here in this panel. So first of all, I would like to introduce myself here. So I am an indigenous person. I'm here with my traditional uh, costume, which is an akusama that uh, we call in our language. I have my feathers here in my head. So the whole world already knows the solution. I know how to uh, care for our planet. When we look at and we know that the science and the white man has advanced very much in order to understand, to understand the changes that must be uh, done in order to save the planet. So the indigenous culture and all the traditional knowledge from the indigenous peoples and all the different peoples, because the diversity is huge. They all know. And if we get together, and if we can somehow uh, and make like the whole society to understand as a whole, this is a big challenge. Because some of us don't know, don't understand the house that they live in. And we all must understand that we must care for this house of ours. So this is very clear. So the big world conferences and big debates that are promoted, they show that this planet is really in need of a better care because otherwise we will all go to disappear. Everything that we are doing and the way that we are somehow using and caring about this house, it, it's, it's done in a very bad way. I believe that we indigenous people, we are following uh, being guided by what nature teaches Uh, like the nature's guidance. And we do have a format to understand this and, and how we communicate with nature to such an extent that we can um, we can share with others all the time. We can share our knowledge. So with the others knowing and understanding so that this is our culture and our way of doing things, we can be safe. We do not use our knowledge to sell to the other. This is not part of a negotiation. What we try to do is that we all together at the same time understand the importance of protecting ourselves, cure ourselves, and use the forest the best way. So this is our way of doing things, the way we live here in the forest. So here we have our life. So we understand that all human beings are part of our own life. We are one of the uh, important elements of the forest. So this is how we work. And our effort is to that our children take over this role in terms of like responsibilities and uh, the understanding of the importance of caring for the continuity of our knowledge and our life. And what we notice is that the world 
the outside world, the non-indigenous, they are being uh, used as the means. So the ones who pay more, uh, those that have, uh, have anticipated or found out, that they use this as, as a merchandise. They do not have this for the whole society, for the people. So this is just like to ensure power. And this is well placed in the world as a business, you know? So they have the patents and uh, they become like the, the sole owners of a knowledge, of a product, of, of findings, and they transform this, linking this to economic interests, which is very much different from the indigenous world. So there's a difficulty in order to overcome these challenges. We know that a science could be could be used like to save humanity from the uh, point of view in this logic that we indigenous people use, but most of the times it's being used like for control, you see? And when this is done, the population that doesn't have access to this knowledge, uh, it, it stays in a much more difficult position towards life. We must get together. We do have the solution. We know everything. We know how to do it. In order to understand the importance of the forest and uh, the people from the forest, the indigenous population, we must understand the importance of science as well, it, its contribution to the humanity as a whole in order to take care of our home. So these are like a point of view that must dialogue so we can overcome. It's not that we uh, don't know that the planet is uh, moving towards a very bad uh, point. So we see the, the Amazon um, being burned and we are afraid. We are scared because we see that it is not in a strategic position like globally or here in Brazil. We, we cannot like blame the uh, neighbor countries responsibility like for carrying uh, the people in our forest because here in Brazil, we are being uh, uh, bad treated. We must uh, leave the conversation alone and we must step into practice and action transforming, making it happen. So our future is threatened because it, it seems to me that people and the young generations are losing their hope, they're losing their strength to uh, ask and demand and uh, we indigenous people, we understand that the life cycle, so Francisco Pianco, it doesn't belong to me. We uh, connect our life cycle to a project, to uh, our people. We just like one step in a big ladder. We cannot compare uh, that what I want, you know, like living what I want, I will do what I want. Our life, it's, uh, it's fulfilled when you can contribute more for the cause, for the defense, for protection of our people. This is our mission, you see? And we must restore and bring back this youth, this uh, will, so they will take care of their own future. They will uh, plan something for the future. And uh, the young people are very important. The responsibility, as early as possible. I began when I was 12 or 13, 14 maybe. Participating in uh, this uh, fight, you see, we, uh, 
don't need to become adults in order to achieve uh, an important position uh, that we can contribute. In our culture, we'll begin very early because our time is short. Our time is very short. So we do have the recipe, we know how to do it, but I believe that we are lacking attitude. So if, if you could come here to our community to understand how we live, if the whole humanity, all human beings all over the world had this understanding about the earth, how to care about the rivers and the forests and the biodiversity. So maybe we wouldn't have any problem like to think about as uh, something that we would be concerned about. It would be much safer, but what is happening in the world is uh, what frightened us. Now they want to uh, open new roadways. Why? This is not a demand for the people in the, the, the Amazon, like very close to us. They want to uh, open like roadways, like to uh, that will uh, cut down trees and uh, the speech is the uh, development. This is destruction. This is a, a threat for human life and also like for the whole planet. So I also would like to say that it would be very difficult if we uh, didn't know as much as we know about the solutions for the uh, planet. Thank you. Thank you, Pianco. It's very important what you said, so thank you very much. We will get back to you. So you pointed out very important topics, you know, that we should pay attention in terms of the roads and also how uh, your uh, people are fighting the COVID pandemic. I will get back to you uh, later. So Fabio, listening to Luciana and Francisco, I know that you have put on the table some important ideas about science. So I would like to ask you two things. So first, if you could just like briefly tell us at what moment are we currently living? We are living this sixth wave of uh, extinction. So could you just give us like a snapshot of where we are? and how much we've lost. And you also talked about things that we've lost that we don't even know existed. So, uh, yes, so just like highlighting this. So the United Nations have created a, 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 a governmental platform uh, related to the ecosystems and it's a group of scientists that get together and periodically they provide reports of the biodiversity uh, status in the planet. So this platform came up in 2012 and the first reports began in 2016. But when it appeared at that moment of the creation of the United Nations, they uh, had a mandate to, like to the scientific community and for this specific group, but not only like to have a report based in uh, scientific aspects of the white people, but we had to promote this dialogue and we should bring elements to the report of non-scientific elements from the traditional people, indigenous population, art, religion, and so on. And these reports, they show uh, some of these numbers that I have shown. So uh, currently we are losing, uh, there are different estimates, but uh, around like 101,000 species that would be expected if we didn't have any human action on the planet. So this is the size of our footprint when it comes to the biodiversity and this footprint, there are some origins. And one is that the loss of habitat, like deforestation, the fires, as we saw this year in the wetlands and in the forest, two main factors of the loss. Climate change is another factor. And uh, reefs, aquatic reefs and uh, mammals and the climate variation, everything that we are being affected by. 
invasive species that are, we bring like we move uh, species like from one place to another and then it comes to one different location and eliminates like local species so this is something that we call the extinction uh, chains which is like the fifth important uh, chain so when one species is extinct it has such an intimate relation with the extinct so all the others in the chain are become extinct as well so most of the times especially in the tropical world when we think about the amazon forest there are so many species and so many biological diversity many of them we don't even name them so recently some friends of ours they found one species of like a plant when we have it all over the Americas, that it's the biggest leaf in the world. So can you imagine this gigantic leaf so that human beings had never seen it before? And then we have like a new species of like monkeys here where I near where I live, like the Tijuca forest that was a replanted forest. We find different uh, insect species every day so everything that we don't know and everything that we lose so and as we lose some of this uh, uh the, this family of the, the coronavirus and yellow fever everything is uh the result of uh, the, the destruction of some of this species so this link of the loss of biodiversity and our well-being and the well-being of all the species this is an, uh, a relation that science is, knows for ages, so we know the way out, as Francisco has said. So on one side, we have uh, the science and we have some knowledge. They have a lot more of a traditional knowledge, indigenous that are not ours, but we, we have to promote this dialogue. And we also need art to inspire people. We need uh, friends like from spirituality, different religions to get together and bring this message. And, and uh, like this is our home, as Francisco said, and we have to get together, hold hands and work together. So this is, uh, that's about it. The numbers are not pretty, Daniela. Okay, now we can hear you, Daniela. I'm sorry, I apologize. I must have changed something. So these numbers are not really pretty. It's uh, such an ignorance, like to lose all this wealth and um, uh, the other day you were telling me that we and also like the language uh, the, the wealth of all the different languages that we have so in brazil we have like 288 different languages being spoken most of them in the amazon uh where francisco is and the um Ashenica people at the honor so we have more languages being spoken in the amazon than in the un this is amazing. So, Luciana, so thank you for uh, your initial words. I would like to ask you, so you introduce uh, in this discussion of this profession of biodiversity and uh, pop and all the experience that Natura has with the communities. So you said that we learn and we made mistakes. So could you just like, give us some examples it would be interesting to uh, hear the examples of our products and this relation with the communities and what we've done wrong and uh, the pathways that you see that are more assertive. Uh, so, Daniela, I, uh, this, is, uh, this is interesting when we heard like uh, what Francisco said that we must uh, leave uh, just like the speech and get into the practice and what is development so this is something that we have to uh rethink about when we look at the amazon region and uh when we think about the deforestation and oh this strategy called development and we have like 19 percent of the region being uh, suffering deforestation 
and we see that the forest doesn't it's not very resilient and we have some studies that if we reach a 25 percent of deforestation we get to a point of no return that's what we call like the tipping point and then the forest is not going to be able to regenerate and then we will lose this flow of water which is so important for the uh, region and uh, like you can imagine the impact and and when we think about like the traditional development, there are some important numbers. So 70% of the GDP in Latin America depends of the, uh, the rain that comes from the Amazon. So if we, our model, which is basically based in agriculture, so we need the water, you see? So especially most of the Brazilian agriculture depends in the rain and, um, that we do not have the irrigation that we depend on the rain. So we must change this uh, model of development. So we have to promote a dialogue when we think about the economic model. So we, in 1998, like 20 years back, and then we were asking like Natura, so like inspired by the Eco 92, and we discussed and we brought this subject for the biodiversity, all the uh, people from the world were talking about biodiversity. And then we try to promote agreements in terms of uh, protection of biodiversity and what was like the sustainable use of the soils. And many countries uh, were actually getting into the discussion. And then uh, all the discussion went to the United Nations right after the uh, Airport 92. And we were looking everything that we were, like uh, the name of our company is Natura. We uh, w thought how little we were looking at the Brazilian biodiversity at that moment, 1996, we noticed and we realized that we depended and we were buying more ingredients from biodiversity that had been brought by the colonizers then to the Brazilian Reserve. So then in 1998, Natura began prospecting, looking at this uh, new uh, way of looking at the biodiversity, but we didn't know how to operate. And Brazil had uh, got through a shock when uh, Japan panted like, uh, some of the Brazilian uh, products and it, we were like, well, wait a minute, what is happening? So we were talking about our own biodiversity and our biological diversity and how could Japan obtain a patent? And we had to be very careful because we were the holders of this incredible wealth. And then that's how Natura got closer to different partners in the region. And during this journey, and when the Ecos brand was launched, we were absorbing new ingredients and then we uh, discovered uh, this new Amazon and we found the territories and we found so much wealth in terms of the physical aspects of the dense forest, full of genetic resources, not well known by the Brazilians. We, up to this date, uh, we talk about this as if we were not part of it and we, we Brazilians do not look at, to the Amazon and when we look at that black cloud that reached the city of Sao Paulo 2019, we said, wow, wait a minute, the Amazon is very close to us. And at that moment, Natura was a kind of like a reformatting its work processes. And how did we do that? So first, we want to promote innovation. We that was a provisory measure in 2002 stating about the relation of the exploration of the generic uh, material and the relation with the traditional communities and the people so all the knowledge that comes from the culturally and traditionally from these people we must somehow pay back and share the benefits this economic wealth uh, uh, with the population. But this provisory measure uh, was in 2002 and Natura had begun this process in 99. And then we had to discuss with many different organizations and many of our partners helped us to uh, 
promote and, and find uh, what were the benefits. So a company that uh, we didn't have like technology platforms to do that. So you can imagine how to get to those territories, all the scientific studies and all the traditional knowledge, it was incredible and it was very important, but we didn't know a lot about it. It was not very clear because there was not industrial scale. So we had to promote an immersion and relate and create policies. We made many mistakes and we uh, ended up reaching a, a policy that helped us to build up the law uh, that passed in 2015. So we had to make mistakes and we had to do it right. And then this is how we helped the Brazilian economy. And now 20 years later, we, we have like 7,000 families in the productive chain involving ingredients that our beauty consultants at that time were talking about. So what is this? Can I apply this on my skin? What is this? They have never heard about some of the ingredients that we could found in the forest. And some of them that were being used to eat some they were using to produce other products and they did not have any economic interest on that. And they use for the cosmetology that would promote some sort of income. It was very important to explain that and state and create this new policy. So thank you, Lucena. I will get back to you. I would like to listen to Francisco again. So Francisco, Bianco, if you could tell us where you are. So you've described a little bit about it at the beginning of your speech. So uh, you said if you could see how we live, so people have no idea how you live. So this is an opportunity. Francisco, if you could share where you are and some of your knowledge that you have and I, I was reading uh, an interview that uh, you gave the other day in which you described when you were a boy, when you saw like the woodcutters and uh, lumberjacks. So if you could talk a little bit, so we know so little about it. So first, we, we didn't know we didn't know to what extent like the lumberjack could cause so much damage for nature because we had never lived uh, this experience until the moment that the machines were reaching our territory and begun like cutting uh, down trees and taking the trees and uh, filling up like the rivers with wood like changing our environment and our way of living in such a dramatic way so it was a in huge impact so i was born and i brought up like feeling this tension uh, that our people was living uh, believing that the white man was very strong and very powerful to destroy the forests and destroy the rivers and um, like all the uh, the water resources so we had uh, problems with uh, the water supply like dirty water was such a damage that really uh, affected us very much so from that moment on that we uh, became like the whistleblowers of the situations we began working recovering our territory because we had to bring back the natural environment that we had in the past. Because it's in the rivers that we teach our children. It's in the forest that we teach our children. That we, it's like the daily routine. That's how we uh, promote and we convey like knowledge and life moves on and continues and perpetuates. So from that moment on, 
It was a very difficult work to recover almost like 40% of our territory that had been uh, destroyed by the uh, woodcutter companies. So we had a way like to uh, take care of our territory. So before we had the demarcation of the indigenous lands, we were like walking around the rivers, building up our houses. And these houses, you had uh, them for a period of uh, time, like eight to 10 years. And then we would uh, move on to a different place. And this new place was enriched because everything that we had in terms of fruits and food, we, we would bring it to the area where we were living so we could like uh, move things around, you know? So then 15 years later, you could begin everything again with a much uh, richer soil. So in, in our minds, this was the way that we could take care of our territory. We never left a land uh, being uh, spoiled by our activities. So this movement, after we had the demarcation of the land, we began like designing a strategy in order to recover our territory that was being harmed and bringing back the species and the rivers, the fishes. And uh, it was such a work that it, it, it enriched our knowledge even more because we went after uh, getting techniques from abroad and knowledge to help us in this kind of recovery because this agroforestry system, each moment, you have to improve, especially when we move the, the format that we occupy the territory. So we are well prepared to take care of our territory in this uh, current format. We have a plan like to manage uh, the soil in the territory. You know what to do and what not to do with our territory. And we act collectively. We cannot believe that this territory belongs to one. It belongs to everyone. Independently from your age group, you must be present, like protecting the territory. We have created an organization, and this organization uh, circulates uh, beyond this internal work. We can uh, talk to all our neighbors. We have many uh, partner institutions looking uh, to give some visibility to what we are doing and uh, uh, trying to give support to our internal agendas and also in the relation with our partners. So we've been discussing quite a lot that the companies like Natura and others must, like in their profit, they must discuss like a quota that will be like the return to help the Amazon. So it, it must be noticed, this kind of investment, you see, because it's pointless if the company is only like a come here and make good use of it, because the impact of all the actions and everything that is happening, it's much bigger. So even Natura won't have any problems like raw materials for the products. So the companies must be concerned also about like macro things, because sooner, that they can imagine it. We will have like small little islands in the forests that will are not going to be sustainable. We will have like a savanna. So we must invest along this line because the Brazilian state is not being uh, capable of having like the conditions like to halt deforestation and inspect and comply with the Brazilian legislation. So like we have the debate, but we, we have other issues. So here we have our territory that is healthy, that we can leave. Our way of living is well taken care of and we can live well. 
sustentável no nosso território. We make a, we, a sustainable use of the land, but we, we have, we must, we need more partners up with us in this uh, fight. And this is our, Natura is a big partner. And we have to open up like new uh, fronts that will enable us to uh, have better contribution. So this is all I wanted to say. If I get and I dive into details and how uh, the life is, it's very difficult to translate. Uh, I tell you that we live for all and we live for everything. We don't live uh, isolatedly. And we are here, like debating with our neighbors and our partners all the time to, in order to protect this region. So we, like opening new roads uh, in the forest, this, is, this cannot happen. Uh, we must uh, define well what is going to be done. So we are suffering like threat at this very moment and we will make it public. We are trying to get and gather all the information because this is, I mean, this is an absurd. There is no justification to open new roads like in the Amazonian forest. And we've seen so many problems when we open, uh, we've opened roads in the past in our forests, but we will fight, we will fight. Thank you, Pianco. Thank you very much. And everything that I you say, give us an idea of what you're saying. So, Fabio, I will skip you, and I will talk to Luciana again, uh, because of what Pianco has just said. And we have one question here, Luciana. I can't read it. Maybe it's a little bit cut, like the name. Like I can't read the last name. So how Natura helps the indigenous people? So what are the actions that could be expanded at this moment that people are not caring for the Amazon? Okay, so thank you, Francisco. I feel I like the call, you see, and I feel very connected to everything that we had a recent study in the past. June last year, we had uh, this uh, long run understanding of how to manage the Amazon. Looking at the Amazon, it's not only innovations and ingredients that we are doing, we have to go beyond. And we, we have to mobilize like Natura and understand what is this new bioeconomy. And we moved, we made a big step forward and uh, we, we are dealing with the communities and promoting like local development in the real way. And in 2019, we, we, we had a different ways of looking at things like uh, Francisco was saying, and we were looking for new ingredients and Natura, what we were doing at that time, we were thinking, well, wait a minute, is this new model like valuing like the traditional communities and the traditional people developing new economies so they would have like a source of income? Does it really make sense? Is it really a, a feasible? And what else can we do along with that? And then we had some measures and then we were acting in such a way in terms of uh, thinking about like deforestation and we, we want to reach like the zero deforestation and we are deeply involved in that. And we had huge numbers at this moment, but we want to fight for that. We, we have to stop deforestation. And then we have this new model of bioeconomy that we have to spread this all over the Amazon and zero deforestation until 2025. And Brazil committed itself last year, but we understand that Natura plays a very important role and all the uh, power of the relation that we have established with new partners, we must mobilize 
everyone we can to halt deforestation and comply with the Brazilian law and also like grillage in the land. And this model of development that uh, they want to impose like top down. And the question that uh, was being uh, made, so we do have this mission and we began this year, the end of last year, we began mobilizing like towards the end of deforestation and protecting the Brazilian territory. So the Amazon, and also other ecosystems. So currently we have with the indigenous people, we have the same trajectory that Natura had with its uh, relationship with the uh, people that provide us with the raw materials we are managing and we are learning from them how they manage the territory. And we believe that we can have the development of the raw materials, but we also believe that we can go beyond. So the forest now has the capacity to provide like ecosystemic services, as Fabio has said. So it's the water and the, the wealth of the biodiversity, everything that is being safeguarded there. So if we leave and if we create uh, this risk of deforestation, like the uh, global warming is going to increase. So we have to help these people because when we look and look at all the, the different regions and all the indigenous people in which you do not have invasion, you know that the conservation of the forest is very uh, uh, big so we are helping this and we are looking and we are thinking about conservancy and we are trying to help the indigenous population thank you luciana so that's where like the indigenous territories it's very clear that uh that is at the level of the deforestation uh, we have bigger deforestation actions in some areas than in others. So I uh, will just like ask you to give like a final uh, remarks, okay? So Fabio, I have a question for you actually a lot, but one of them is, Fabio, you are a forestry engineer, right? This is your background. So I would like to ask you, you talked about regeneration. We must like uh, the, the conservation aspects that we cannot uh, create any more deforestation. And this is the moment for uh, reforestation and regeneration. And you usually say that uh, we have like hot spots of biodiversity that are very important. I would like you to uh, mention some of them and also answer that we know that reforestation, do we know how to imitate the forest? Do we know how to do it like the same way as the, uh, the rainforest or the Atlantic rainforest? This is a very good question, Daniela, you know? Firstly, so here in Brazil, we have six uh, continental biomes. And the continental ones are along among the six ones, like the uh, the wetlands, and we have some of the hot spots of the biodiversity, which are places that we have biological diversity, many different species that only happen in those places, but those systems that have lost its natural coverage, like the Atlantic uh, forest that has lost like 60% and the Cerrado more than 50%. But also we have uh, the Caatinga and the Pampa, also have this level of threat that it's very important. So the Amazon and the wetlands are in better level of conservation, but the Amazon has a very um, narrow limit. If we go beyond 20% and we have already reached, we have this imbalance that Lucena has mentioned, this uh, the, the tipping point that the Amazon eventually uh, would become like a poor savanna it's um we it would lose its natural coverage so this is the scenario you see so we must uh, 
preserve what is left. So half of the Amazon is within the indigenous lands and conservation units, and 20% that have already been moved. So 30% remains. So this 30% are areas that are public, that belong to all the public people. It belongs to everyone. And it about the 30% that incites a grillage and crime that some of the governments actually promote that. So Brazilians must understand that this is our own home, as Francisco has said, and we must take care and good care. And we have to uh, close, look very closely. And these, it's important that these areas and these, uh, these areas must be seen as protective for the indigenous e, uh, population and local uh, population. And then we have areas to recover Brazil. Brazil has 150 million hectares uh, of cattle. Among this 150,000, 60,000 uh, are like uh, lively uh, farms that are very unproductive. And I'm not taking in consideration like the pampas and the uh, wetlands and the kayaching that have um, that been there like for 300 years, very extensive. I'm talking about like new areas, like exploration for real estate that is much in the Amazon. So 60% of the unproductive areas, if they become productive with the regenerative agriculture, with the of, of regeneration of the forest, we will double the production of food without cutting one in a single tree. So we know these numbers for more than 10 years. So Ibrapa uh, has uh, raised this number. So one way to solve this problem was the old agricultural reform that we never saw happening. So this is one of the, the ways towards the future in terms of the solutions. So uh, all we need is like political will. So we know, as Francisco said, we know the solutions, but we do not have to dialogue. I will get back to you just like for one minute for your final remarks. So uh, Francisco. So more than once, you, no, you brought this uh, idea of this degradation that uh, happens like those little islands, as you mentioned. And you talked about like the threat of roads. And uh, if, believe, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. So we're talking about like two roads are going to cut the territory. So could you give us a, a little bit more of information? So this message of what is happening, Francisco, so we can understand a little bit better. So there is one road, Cruzeiro do Sul, this is the name that uh, of the city, maybe like the biggest, the second biggest city in the state of Acre, the border with uh, Peru. Now they want to connect it with uh, another city that is on the Peruvian side. It's so that cuts like the national park and uh, we have like indigenous lands and on Brazilian and on the Peruvian side. And we don't know like the, the studies, like the preliminary studies for this road that uh, show uh, like the impacts of such a road. So we know by experience what has been done and what can eventually happen in case of uh, the opening of a, a road, road in the middle of the forest. And uh, on the other hand, uh, right here, like next to the border, Oh, and on our side and the Peruvian side, they are connecting Cayali, which is a big river, with Juruá. Juruá is another uh, uh, important, uh, very important river on the Brazilian side. So uh, the springs, they, they are connecting like a road, just like purely for the exploration of wood. So this is... Uh, is going to cause such a damage so big for this region. So here, we, there is no control like on the Peruvian side or, or the Brazilian side. And the only protection that we have is the difficulty in terms of access. So the, the state can control um, like a road, imagine like a, a state road. So we know uh, the consequences and we know all the interests that are 
behind. So in the midst of so many challenges, I should think in terms of protecting and the sustainability of the region, we are being threatened by this uh, road that uh, doesn't give us any safety. So Acre has had an experience. We had the transoceanic, like the city of Rio Branco and Porto Maldonado. There is a, a road that we know uh, what uh, it has caused and it doesn't bring any uh, positive change to our region. So this is what is happening. So we would like to close here uh, saying that, uh, that we are very much concerned that it's not very clear, like the process of like building these new roads. And we want more responsibility from the state with us that are here, like from the Brazilian state and also like from the Peruvian state. Thank you. Bianco, we must be heard. These are my final remarks. So I would like to thank everyone for this space. I would like to get back to you, so we we'll give you final remarks if you want to, if they allow me. But I will go like to Luciana. Luciana, your final remarks. One minute. So first, I would like to thank this moment that we can have this dialogue like Fabio, like bringing this reality. This is so difficult, it's so important. And for us that we see uh, all these impossibilities related to the pandemic, and this is an alert. We must, we have, uh, everyone is looking uh, to us and people are looking at us like the importance of this patrimony and this heritage that we have, and we must take over this responsibility and become uh, this transformation vector. So we've lost the technological boom, which is in India and China, but there is a new economy that is uh, coming up, is the uh, bioeconomy and the economy of the forest and the economy of the people from the forest. So this is the time that we have to take over this new model. There is no discussion what is agro and what is uh, the forest. So Francisco has said that, so uh, agroforestal uh, systems, there is a convergence and there is a dialogue. So Brazil has this power and the potential to change this towards the future for the next 20 years. This is the comment that I wish to make and that we look at this here as the turning point, as something that is important for all of us. Thank you, Luciana. Fabio. Thank you very much. I would like to just like to close like uh, congratulating you, Daniela, Luciana, Francisco. You are what I call like uh, the ones who are responsible for the regeneration. So each one of you, you are responsible for the regeneration of our planet. And we need this inspiration that you brought us, but we also need uh, what Francisco has said, this young generation more than never, they must become like the translators and the interpreters. We need a people like to promote this dialogue. We have to promote this dialogue with nature. So I would like to salute our uh, interpreters of uh, Brazilian Sign Language, which is a, this important transition that we will need for the next years and uh, to make everyone uh, to communicate and understand each other. I am the one, uh, I am a teacher, I hate this, but uh, we have to place ourselves in the students' shoes and we like to close. So uh, I would talk uh, about Moises, like Francisco's brother, and he said something that I never forget. He said that his university is the forest and that the teacher is the silence. And this is how I close uh, my speech here. Daniela, back to you. On my side, I will pass it, the floor back to Francisco for his final remarks, Francisco. I believe that our youth must understand this moment and the, the size and the, their importance 
so they have to uh, set their foot on the ground and they have to feel and that this is their home that it belongs to them and for one uh, action uh, that will promote facts that will protect the whole entire planet it has to be done in, in in a very integrated way so all the people in the world must work together they must feel part of um, all the inhabitants of the planet must uh, take over uh, this caring attitude and then we can help our planet to have a longer life. We can't uh, look at the planet and to our home, it's just like thinking about uh, this uh, our own life cycle in an individual way. So the planet and the diversity and all the different people must represent all of us uh, in, for many generations to come. So an event like this contributes in such a way and Museu do Amanhã has this uh, has helped us quite a lot, like to raise our voices and as an organization. So thank you once again very much. So we are here in the forest. I thank you all. I thank you all very much. I I would like to thank uh, for this opportunity. And one one of the only uh, good things of this pandemic is this. Uh, all these webinars that are happening and how we can articulate and connect ourselves even being far apart and then we can discuss and make people hear all these different messages and now looking at francisco bianco with this uh, genuine leadership like a family of leaders i remember one connection that fabio uh, mission art and culture uh, this connection like like Milton Nascimento that went to Acre and to the Pachininka territory. Uh, one anthropologist that took him like many years ago and then brought uh, uh, a beautiful songs and promoting this dialogue that Fabio was talking about at the beginning of his speech. So I, I cannot, I don't, don't want to forget to thank this room, like the International uh, Showcase of Cinema. And they always ask us like to have a more stable internet. So now this is it. I'd like to thank all of you. It was great. I We have one message that is from Pedro. que o filósofo Homer Simpson comprou um bilhete de loteria. Pôs o envelope assim contra a luz e viu que estava premiado, 100 dólares. Entrou na fila para pagar, um dólar pelo 100 do prêmio. Uau! Aí, enquanto esperava, olhou para as mercadorias expostas naquele corredorzinho que leva ao caixa e viu uma barra de chocolate. Começou a salivar. Estava ali ao alcance da mão pelo preço de um dólar. Entre o um envelope com o prêmio futuro da loteria numa mão e o chocolate presente imediato na outra mão, instalou-se a dúvida na cabeça de Roma. O chocolate agora já ou o dinheiro de 100 chocolates no futuro próximo, quando recebesse o prêmio lotérico? Um chocolate agora ou 100 dólares amanhã? Chocolate ou prêmio? Agora ou depois? Presente ou futuro? O breve prazer imediato ou o prazer sustentado mais tarde? Chocolate ou bilhete premiado? Agora ou depois? Como vocês já devem ter adivinhado, nosso arquétipo da condição humana, Homer Simpson, não aguentou esperar. Em vez de ganhar 100 dólares no futuro, gastou um dólar para abocanhar o chocolate no presente. O psicanalista Francisco Dalt costuma contar essa parábola para descrever e explicar o célebre princípio do prazer, enunciado por Sigmund Freud. É mesmo uma demonstração que, embora caricata, não deixa de ser um preciso retrato de nosso imediatismo. Macacos, bípedes e pelados da sabana africana, animais fracotes e desamparados, ameaçados por tudo que nos rodeava, 
nós moldamos nosso DNA com a necessidade de reação rápida em decisões impensadas pela sobrevivência. A reflexão e o pensamento de longo prazo são consequências sofisticadíssimas de milênios de evolução. A ideia do futuro como um lugar que pode ser melhor é algo muito recente, tem menos de 600 anos, data da Revolução Científica. A primeira vez que o homem, diante dos mistérios do mundo, deixou de lado o pensamento mágico para fazer a declaração revolucionária que inaugura a ciência moderna. Eu não sei. Reconhecer sua ignorância levou nossa espécie a um caminho de transformação, veloz e profundo. Ocorre que esse mesmo ser, capaz de fundar a ciência moderna, dotado do sofisticado pensamento de longo prazo, sábio a ponto de conseguir até prever e moldar o futuro, ainda traz em si, em seu código genético, as marcas da implacável natureza humana, imediatista, reativa, predadora, irracional e violenta. Mais uma vez, citando Freud, está aí o tal do mal-estar da civilização. Esses dois impulsos, um de planejamento e construção do futuro, em oposição constante a outro, de soluções imediatistas de sobrevivência, de tão curto prazo quanto o tempo presente, nos levaram ao impasse que a humanidade encara nesse século XXI. Hoje, a gente sabe o suficiente para reconhecer e avaliar a perigosa armadilha que esse mesmo conhecimento, usado sem sabedoria, nos armou. É mais que um paradoxo. É uma equação que só pode ser enfrentada de forma dialética, com as armas da democracia e como ela se expressa no mercado das ideias. Não foram a ciência e a tecnologia que nos levaram ao abismo para o qual a humanidade parece se sentir atraída. Foi o mau uso político desses saberes. É a manipulação desses poderes que nos desafia. Temos os meios, sabemos nossos fins, em todos os sentidos, para o sempre e para o nunca. Porém, mais que uma questão de princípios, também em todos os sentidos, nossa senha poderia ser a palavra recomeço. Temos as capacidades para extinguir a fome, as guerras, as doenças. Nossa saída, mais uma vez, é pelo caminho que nos levou, que nos trouxe a essa encrenca, a política. Nossa saída exige também os mesmos instrumentos que, usados de forma inconsequente, nos desencaminharam as ferramentas da ciência traduzidas em tecnologias. Por isso, a ideia pode ser de eterno recomeço. Por isso, um encontro como esse é tão vital, tão necessário. É em ocasiões assim que se renovam as lideranças num diálogo sem fim entre tradição e futuro. Não haverá futuro se não resgatarmos e preservarmos valores e saberes tradicionais, dos quais cada vez mais a boa ciência se aproxima e com os quais crescentemente se realimenta. Assim como não há tradição sem futuro. Os valores humanos não são absolutos. Surgem, se mantêm e se transformam como reflexos da natureza. Sempre foi assim. Primeiro reagimos à natureza, dela nos defendemos. Hoje cumprimos a quadratura do circo. Para defendermos, temos que defender a natureza. Passou da hora de entendermos o legado de Charles Darwin, em sua acepção mais plena. Se por muito tempo prevaleceu a ideia de que a sobrevivência do mais apto se dava pela competição, hoje a biologia nos maravilha com a descoberta, a revelação, a exposição do papel muito amplo e decisivo da cooperação. Contemplar a biodiversidade é se deslumbrar com os mecanismos cooperativos entre as espécies de todos os reinos. Hoje temos todas as evidências do tanto de crucial que temos a aprender com os animais, as plantas, os fungos, os elementos. Em seu excepcional trabalho sobre a Amazônia, na série Arrabalde, publicada na revista Piauí, João Moreira Salles replica uma afirmação que ouviu seguidas vezes nas fronteiras e franjas do nosso bioma. 
movidos pelo espírito colonizador, cegos para a realidade, para que estava na frente deles, pés sobre a terra, que já tinha sido floresta, todos repetem a mesma frase. Quando eu cheguei aqui, não tinha nada. Dizem diante do lugar que tem tudo, tudo de que precisamos para dar continuidade à aventura humana. Nossa luta deve ser contra essa cegueira, nossa bandeira iluminista. Não há lucro maior do que o porvir. Através da história humana, foi como se a infância não existisse. A criança não passava de um projeto de adulto, um ser incapaz, alguém que chorava e dava trabalho até chegar a uma idade mínima em que pudesse contribuir na vida do trabalho. Uma brutal exploração da infância advinda no início da Revolução Industrial, aí pela primeira vez falou-se dos direitos da criança. Na realidade, quem falou foram os genitores que estavam, na verdade, a defender sua primazia no direito de explorar seus próprios filhos. Olha o quanto progredimos. Hoje a consciência ambiental faz os seres humanos pensarem pela primeira vez, de forma consequente, nos direitos daqueles que ainda estão para nascer. A eles, nossos filhos, netos, bisnetos, tataranetos, dediquemos todas as nossas vidas, nossas mortes, nosso eterno renascer, a permanência do projeto humano. Muito obrigado a todos que aqui jogaram luz sobre os caminhos que temos que trilhar para forjar o amanhã. Não esmoreçam, por favor. <SILENCIO>